Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a great show for you tonight. We have Dr. Paula Noel McPhee and uh, she'll be talking about her uh, research and, and medical work along with uh, Dana Canales. Welcome back, Dana. Nice to meet you, you. Paul and Noel. Then over in the wings, hey, over in the wings is Mr. John Cornett, who is back to play some music. Thanks for being here, John. Oh, hell, boss. Great to be here. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, folks, for watching. We have uh, a lot of hemp news. Uh, Canada became legal this week. We have some medical studies we'll talk about. And uh, then we'll be back with uh, uh, interviewing Dr. Paula Noel McPhee about her medical work. So stay tuned as we bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. Okay, our first story tonight is from Canada. That's the big news in the whole world about marijuana this week from the federal capital, Ottawa, Ontario. Legislation permitting the possession, use, cultivation, and retail sale of cannabis took effect on Wednesday. Canada is only the second country after Uruguay and South America in the world to explicitly legalize cannabis production and sales nationwide. The new federal law permits those age 18 and older to legally possess up to 30 grams and grow cannabis, up to four plants of any size, per household. Individual provinces possess the authority to enact additional regulations with respect to its distribution, such as raising the legal age limit to purchase cannabis or by restricting home grow operations. The act federally licenses commercial producers of cannabis and of certain cannabis-infused products while permitting provinces to regulate retail sales in public, government-operated stores, and private stores subject to local rules. The new social use regulations do not amend Canada's existing medical marijuana access laws, which have been in place since 2001. Separate legislation is expected to be forthcoming to facilitate a uh, process where those with past convictions for minor marijuana offenses may be granted pardons. A little more information about that in a moment. The enactment of the law fulfills a campaign pledge by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who promised shortly after taking office in 2015 to legalize and regulate the marijuana market. Prime Minister Trudeau formally opposed legalization, though his, uh, and he and his mother have both used it in the past. And uh, just across the border on the West Coast, the Vancouver Airport has announced that passengers will be allowed to freely smoke cannabis before their flights. Vancouver Airport in Canada is opening up a dedicated smoking section for cannabis smoking customers after Canada legalized cannabis this week. The areas are outside the terminal, not inside, which uh, remain smoke free, just as in tobacco. A statement on the airline's website reads, quote, we provide a smoke and vape friendly environment inside the airport at all times and for all substances and have designated smoking and vaping areas outside the terminal building for public use. Airport users, as a condition of using the airport facilities, must obey smoke free and vape free signage at all times and for all substances. End quote. Passengers are also allowed to fly with up to 30 grams of cannabis in their suitcase. In Toronto, Ontario, police would like to make a public service announcement. Do not bother us if you think your neighbor is growing or using marijuana. In fact, now in the province of Ontario, cannabis users can partake of cannabis anywhere it's legal to consume tobacco. As of Wednesday, Canada has legalized 
marijuana on a national level, of course. That same day, the province of Ontario passed a bill permitting people to light up in many public places. Ontario residents ages 19 and higher can carry up to 30 grams of cannabis, and they can grow four plants. And uh, the government is also confronting the question of how to deal with half a million citizens in Canada who are convicted of crimes that are no longer crimes. Yesterday, Canada's Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodall announced plans to expedite the sealing of criminal records for people convicted of simple marijuana possession. Under current law, Canadians who want to get their criminal records suspended have to wait five years for a summary offense similar to a misdemeanor or 10 years for an indictable offense similar to a felony. They also have to pay 631 Canadian dollars to the government to get that expunged. Liberal government uh, is backing legislation that would waive the fee and waiting uh, period in marijuana cases involving possession of up to 30 grams or about an ounce which is now legal for adults, defined as people 19 or older in most provinces, though it is 18 or older in Quebec and Alberta. The proposal does not cover people convicted of cultivation or distribution, and it puts the onus on marijuana offenders to apply for sealing instead of doing it automatically. Despite the limitations, Canada's plan is more generous than the policies of most states here in the U.S. that have legalized marijuana. In California, which has gone the furthest to address the lingering consequences of marijuana convictions. The legalization initiative authorized expungement of misdemeanors and downgrading of felonies, but it put the burden on victims of prohibition to seek relief. A law enacted last month will make that process easier by requiring the California Department of Justice to identify marijuana convictions that are potentially eligible for expungement or reclassification and making the changes automatically less prosecutors object. But in other states that allow recreational use, relief is more limited, harder to get, or both. In Colorado and Vermont, for example, cannabis felonies cannot be sealed or downgraded, while in Maine and Alaska, the only option for most marijuana offenders is a pardon from the governor. The next story is out of Rockville, Maryland. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration seeking public comments specific to whether Changes ought to be recommended regarding the international classification of cannabis as a controlled substance by the United Nations. Members of the public have until October 31, 2018 to submit their comments to the FDA for consideration. The FDA says that the comments, quote, will be considered in preparing a response from the United States to the World Health Organization regarding the abuse, liability, and diversion of marijuana and certain other substances. In April, in response to a similar FDA request, Normal had collected and hand-delivered over 10,000 comments to the agency, calling on it to recommend a lifting of international re restrictions criminalizing the plant. We propose that cannabis be removed from the International Drug Convention so that nations that wish to do so, such as ours, may further expand their regulations, governing cannabis use, possession, production, and dispensing for either recreational or medical use. Our next story is from London, in the United Kingdom. British regulators have announced their intent to reclassify certain marijuana-derived products so that they may be made available by prescription. The proposed scheduling change follows a July 2018 government review which concluded, quote, there is now conclusive evidence of medical benefit of cannabis-based products for certain medical conditions, end quote. A number of parents who sought access to cannabis-based tinctures as a treatment for anti-seizures uh, for their children have prominently campaigned for the law change. According to a home office press release, regulators must still define which specific products will be explicitly reclassified from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2. It states, quote, the Department for Health and Social Care, or DHSC, and the Medicines and Health Product Regulatory Agency, or MHRA, will now develop a clear definition of what constitutes a cannabis-derived medicinal product so they can be rescheduled and prescribed. Only products meeting this definition will be rescheduled. Other forms of cannabis will be kept under controls and will not be available on prescription." End quote. Until that process is completed, clinicians will have to in apply to an independent expert panel in order to seek permission to legally prescribe cannabis-derived products to their patients. 
Another study out of Toronto, Canada, the past use of cannabis is significantly associated with lower odds of diabetes in adults, according to data published in the journal Drug and Alcohol Review. Investigators with the University of Toronto assessed the association between cannabis use and diabetes in a nationally representative sample, while accounting for a range of potential co-founders, uh, including lifestyle behaviors, socio-demographics, and mental health disorders. Compared to non-users, subjects with a history of cannabis use possess an approximately 20% decreased likelihood of diabetes. Those subjects with past year marijuana use possess an approximately 50% decreased risk. Study says, quote, in sum, a decreased likelihood of diabetes for both lifetime and 12 month cannabis users versus non-users was found after accounting for a range of potential confounders, including mental health disorders, end quote, the authors concluded. Although the authors quotient that additional epidemiological studies are needed before protective effects of cannabis can be suggested, the study is one of several population studies identifying a positive association between lifetime cannabis consumption and a reduced risk for diabetes. This study, the relationship between cannabis use and diabetes, results from a national epidemiologic survey on alcohol and related conditions three, appears in this month's edition of Drug and Alcohol Review. Also out of Canada, another study. Various strains of cannabis possess nearly identical ratios of primary cannabinoids such as THC and CBD, according to data published in the journal Scientific Reports. Researchers from the University of British Columbia analyzed the cannabinoid composition of 33 separate cannabis strains obtained from five licensed producers. They reported that most strains, regardless of their origin, name, or whether they were classified as indica or sativa, but as nearly the same quantities of THC and CBD as each other. By contrast, many strains did differ from one another in regard to the abundance of other, less prevalent cannabinoids. The study says, quote, a high abundance compound in plants such as THC or CBD isn't necessarily responsible for the unique medicinal effects of a certain strain, end quote, the study's lead authors opined in a press release. The release went on, quote, understanding the presence of the low abundance cannabinoids could provide valuable information to the medical cannabis community, end quote. The data is consistent with prior analysis finding that many so-called cannabis strains actually possess few significant genetic differences. This study, Chemometric Analysis of Cannabinoids, a Chemotoxomony and Domestication Syndrome, appears in this month's edition of Scientific Reports. Next story is also from London, and I'll be doing a radio show in the morning out of uh, London, Talk Radio London. Tune in at 9 a.m. online, unless you're in London. But the study from, from the UK, patients with advanced forms of cancer exhibit a clinical response to the long-term use of synthetic CBD, according to data published in the journal Anti-Cancer Research. British investigators assessed the effects of twice-daily CBD administration on 119 cancer patients over a four-year period. Synthetic CBD oil extracts were provided by the British biotechnology firm CTI Pharmaceuticals. The subjects consumed the oil for a minimum period of six months. The authors reported that over 90% of the subjects exhibited a clinical response to CBD treatment with some patients experiencing a reduction in tumor size and tumor cell proliferation. Numerous prior studies have demonstrated cannabinoids, particularly CBD and THC, to possess anti-cancer activity. In fact, the United States government has a, the Health and Human Services Department has a patent on cannabis and cannabinoids, THC and CBD for their anti-tumoral and anti-cancer properties. To date, however, this activity has not yet been replicated in controlled human trials. Uh, the authors concluded, quote, the fact that we've been able to document improvement strongly supports further studies of CBD-based products in cancer patients who've exhausted standard treatments, end quote. The full text of this study, Report of Objective Clinical Responses of Cancer Patients to Pharmaceutical Grade Synthetic Cannabidiol, appears online in the website of of anti-cancer research. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws is pleased to welcome 
world famous musician David Crosby, founding member of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young and the Birds to its advisory board. Another story. In Congress this week, the Senate bill to encourage the Department of Veteran Affairs to study medical cannabis, or the VA Medicinal Cannabis Research Act, got one new sponsor for a total of six. The House bill to increase military veterans' access to medicinal cannabis, the Veteran Equal Access Act, got one new co-sponsor for a total of 29. At a state level, four New York Assembly committees held a joint hearing in Manhattan, New York City, on marijuana legalization proposals this week. In Utah, Democratic lawmakers will hold a town hall meeting on medical cannabis next Wednesday. They'll discuss the Utah Medical Cannabis Act, Proposition 2, which is on the ballot to legalize medical marijuana in the state of Utah, and the medical cannabis landscape more broadly. In Rhode Island, regulators added autism spectrum disorders as a medical cannabis qualifying condition, and Michigan Governor Rick Snyder, a Republican, signed legislation into law prohibiting marijuana-infused alcoholic beverages. At a more local level, the mayor of Ocean Springs, Mississippi, is helping to collect signatures for Mississippi's state-proposed 2020 medical cannabis ballot measure. Our last story tonight, a draft Seattle, Washington 2019 legislative agenda says the city of Seattle supports state legislation to allow medical Mar or allow marijuana delivery services, not medical, and cannabis vaping lounges, as well as expunging misdemeanor convictions. That's the end of our hemp news segment for tonight, and uh, John Cornett is standing by. Welcome back, John. It's very good to be back, Paul. You know, I was just thinking, <clears throat> I just need to say this real quick, because it took me a while to remember to say it. Uh, okay, relative to treatment, Please, uh, to anyone who can hear my voice and who can share what I'm saying, uh, don't use cannabis as the last-ditch treatment. Use it first. You know, it might actually save your butt. It may save your, save your life. Anyway, this is a song that uh, where I like to tell the truth, you know. <clears throat> so I wrote a song about it. <laughs> and that's really as simple as it is. It goes like this. Now is the time The time is now To tell the truth To hear the truth To know The truth To know Oppressive lies and fantasies isn't how it has to be in ignorance throwing stones like so many brainless clones sound the alarm re-educate sound the alarm investigate now is the time for the truth Whoa, whoa, now is the time. Whoa, whoa, corporations, governments, rarely ever innocent. Dissension is the only way, and live to see another day. Sound the alarm. Investigate, sound the alarm, re-educate, now is the time for the truth. Whoa, whoa, now is the time. Oh, oh, now is 
the time. Whoa, whoa. Now is the time. Whoa, whoa. Now's the time. <laughs> Thank you. Another song. You might even hop in here and talk. Who knows? <laughs> hey, welcome, Paula, Noel, McPhee. Yes. All right, I said it right. Hey, welcome back, Dana. Thank you. Dana Canales has been a volunteer on our show for a long, long time. How many years? 18 now. 18 years. 18 of the 22 years we've been here on the air. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, Paula Noel, uh, do you prefer to be go by those two names kind of jointly? Or yeah, do you just goes together. Yeah, okay. I just want to be sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so you are, have a doctorate. I do. And what is your doctorate in? Uh, I have a doctorate of philosophy uh -huh. and integral studies with a concentration in recovery of indigenous mind. Okay. Which is also another way of saying decolonization. Decolonization. Yeah. So it's talking about uh, trying to change Western society, perhaps, yeah. away from... Yeah, it's, it's the, kind of about, You know, we've yeah. got colonies all over the world. Right, We've taken right. over North and South America, right. Australia, New Zealand. There's a group of Europeans that are colonizing Palestine right now, if you ask me. Though some people say that makes me uh, racist yeah. for saying that, but I disagree. I'm uh, definitely pro-Jewish but anti-Zionist. That's another mm -hmm. distinction. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the Palestinians were the indigenous people and they're being colonized. There's no doubt about it. Just the same way mm -hmm. that Europeans colonized North America. Mm -hmm. So tell me more. That's a fascinating degree topic. It's not exactly cannabis related. But it's <laughs> well, it kind of defines my research. Uh -huh. um, I spent seven years with tribal elders and healers from all over the world. Um, we went from Mexico to northern Norway up to the, okay. where the Sami people live. Um, we traveled just everywhere and we connected with our own indigenous knowing. So we didn't mm -hmm. go as an anthropologist learning about other cultures to connect with those cultures to take something and bring it back. We actually went to those cultures and the elders taught us how to see our own tribal ways of knowing, our own knowledge. Mm -hmm. So for me being adopted, being raised in Oregon, I didn't, Northeast Portland, I didn't know anything about myself. Mm -hmm. But through all of my time with the elders and my research oh. methods, I found my genealogy and um, it has a very significant history that I now pay forward to my children. But I've also taught at Portland State and I help people resolve that disconnection that we have from where we come from. Mm -hmm. Specific to Eurocentrism and specific to what I would call Western colonized mind, that perpetual cycle that seems to be never ending. Mm -hmm. So I feel the elders gave me and other colleagues of mine a prescription to navigate the effects of Eurocentrism and colonized mind as a non-native person. Mm -hmm. And then there was a track of students who were native students that, that did this work Mm -hmm. um, in decolonization, but from a native way of knowing. How many different indigenous communities did you study or work with? I, I mean, all, all over the world. There's, mm -hmm. There was a sort of a council of tribal elders that I specifically worked with, a kapuna from the Big Island of Hawaii. Okay. Um, I'm very Holly with Makua. The Big Island. He was the kapuna of the Kilauea crater. Okay. Um, so when we'd go to his office, we'd meet him at the edge of the crater and, mm -hmm. you know. How cool. Yeah, it was pretty, it was very cool. Um, but he passed away um, shortly before I went to go visit him. And there were others. There was uh, Mary Jones, who was Choctaw. Uh, my doctoral advisor, Dr. Pila Colorado, is Iroquois in French. Um, mm -hmm. So there was just, then there was Dr. Godoso from Benin, Africa. We spent time at Morehouse College mm -hmm. with Dr. Finch, who's an um, Egyptian scholar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we did, it, it I would expands imagine the globe. I would imagine the with the, the, that variety of cultures, you would have seen a lot of different uh, medicinal modalities or, or ways of using medicine by various peoples. Well, absolutely. I mean, it was really um, a connection to plant medicine and what plant medicine really is. And mm -hmm. then what they taught us to do is to recover the plant medicine specific to our ancestors and our genealogy and where we come from. Mm -hmm. So it When it did takes you get your PhD? Uh, in 2001. Okay. So, so I was 31. 17 years ago. Pretty ambitious and yeah. very young, but I had a lot of things that led up to me being in this program.
I see. Yeah. I see. So, well, that's fascinating in and of <laughs> itself. And I find it particularly fascinating because I'm, I'm anti colonialism yeah, as well. Yeah. Uh, I think that America should be given back to the Native Americans. And uh, I'm kind of disgusted by the U.S. government on a lot of different levels. But as a service connected yeah. U.S. military, veteran with uh, service-connected disabilities. I, I have to throw that in there because I uh, definitely love our country. I just hate our government. And we're but guests on this land. I mean, yeah. really, there's the, the suffering that happened when, the, when we came and the colonies came is still going on. That's right. So, you know, I have to acknowledge that. I have to acknowledge the tribes of this place, the yeah. Wasco and the Grand Ron and the Paiute. It's and happening the across South America, as I mentioned yeah. earlier, in Palestine and, and yeah. all over the world, yeah. unfortunately. So, but you got involved with cannabis medicine. Tell yeah, me how you yeah. went from indigenous <laughs> minds and, yeah. and science to, to working on cannabis medicine. That's well, yeah, so I wrote my doctoral dissertation and we ended up at the State of the World Forum in New York in September of 2000 with uh, Gorbachev and Jim Garrison put on this forum and we brought the indigenous conglomerate to this forum. And so after the forum in six months, if you can even wrap your mind around it, I wrote a book and edited it and published it, which was my doctoral dissertation. Mm -hmm. But the expense of that was my health. So mm -hmm. shortly after um, completing my dissertation, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So when I was diagnosed with MS, I met um, a neurologist, Dr. Roy Swank, and they- um, Where is he? he? Well, he's passed away, but he was chief of neurology at OHSU. Okay. And he was given Professor Emeritus um, mm -hmm. at some point, and he treated patients in the world's longest nutritional study for the effects of diet on multiple sclerosis. So he had a 55 year study that was never really carried on because they didn't use a placebo. Mm -hmm. um, but what he used were people's stories. So when I met him, I just treated him like an elder with knowledge and wisdom. I didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what his credentials were. Mm -hmm. And so I met him and we just connected for two years. And I just sat and listened to his stories, wrote his knowledge down, um, read everything I could in his research library, and everything was saying the same thing, that heart disease, stroke, um, diabetes, MS are nutritional diseases. Mm -hmm. He saw MS as a vascular condition with neurological subsymptoms. So, mm -hmm. so by a vascular condition, you mean something to do with the circulatory system? Yeah, what, what okay. we eat. So, oh, okay. it, you know, he drew a lot of diagrams of how when we eat, if the fat doesn't properly get distributed by the liver, it goes to the brain and that causes that sclerosis process. And how does the lymphatic system handle that as well? I mean, how does the diet affect the Well, if the liver's not doing its job, yeah. it's kind of like the main distributor and powerhouse of everything that we're digesting. It's like kind of the feeder of the body to the organs. And so mm -hmm. if that's not able to get the proper nutrition and the, the villi and the small intestine is jammed up and it can't get w nutrients it needs, it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to go to the rest of the body and get it. And mm -hmm. that's when that the body attacking itself thing starts to happen. So mm -hmm. then it goes to the nerves. Mm -hmm. and it starts to eat away at the nerves to get the fat. I see. So I see. there's, you know, there's a problem there. So Dr. Swank said just, you know, treat it with nutrition. Mm -hmm. at that and, and what kind of nutritional regimen? Uh, he, has, he had a certain protocol that was for pe if people eat meat, this is the protocol, no red meat for the first year and then only three ounces a week after that. Mm -hmm. He wanted, he got me down to 15 grams of saturated fat a day when the average American diet is well over 100. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it wasn't, it, back in the day they called it a low fat diet. I mean, that's what, that's what he called it. But it was really more fruits, it's more plant-based. Mm -hmm. If you eat mm -hmm. plant-based, that's the ideal. But if you eat um, animal products or animal, uh, if you eat meat, then this is the protocol for that. Mm -hmm. And he gave us that choice. Well, you know, the ones like myself that have been on a plant-based swank diet for almost 18 what, 18 years now, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm doing okay. I have other challenges, but mm -hmm. that really led me on the path of how can I use food and plant medicine as a way to heal myself. I see, and so you must have heard how cannabis often kind of uh, stops the progression of multiple well, sclerosis. Well, I had been smoking since I was about 17. I was diagnosed mm -hmm. with clinical depression when I was 16, mm -hmm. and I have, I've had a lot of social anxiety in my life. So what I didn't know is that I was self-medicating. Mm -hmm. um, Another lifer. Yeah, I mean, I, and then, you know, I kind of have a stint as a raver in Portland. We threw house parties back in the early 90s. So I had a, a bit of an oh. other exploration in another realm. But cannabis was always 
always the the. Do you ever do the raves at the Modish building? Um, we did a few at the Coliseum. Uh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Underneath in the underground back in the I day. I see. Okay. <laughs> um, but then, you know, once I started navigating my health challenges, um, really where I got to suppositories is um, my brother was diagnosed with rectal and liver cancer when I was just had gotten pregnant. Let me just interrupt here because I don't think I mentioned this until now, but oh, your yeah. company is called Backdoor Medicine. Yes. And so, the, and it's about cannabis suppository research. And I've heard a lot about that. <laughs> uh, but I think it, this is a, an appropriate time to yeah, mention yeah. your company name, Backdoor Medicine. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So, I, you know, I was just kind of coming out of the, the knowledge that plant-based nutrition and plant medicine can heal the things I've been navigating. I was also... Um, the recipient of a traumatic brain injury when I was five and I was hit in the frontal lobe with a baseball bat Whoa. playing softball in the corner. Mm -hmm. So that had its own So how did you get to suppositories for, for well, cannabis medicine? So it, I got to the point where um, my brother had uh, cancer and I started doing research as a researcher, but I was pregnant, so I couldn't quite wrap my mind around things. But I did find uh, Rick Simpson and cannabis oil, mm -hmm. and I knew that there was something to it. I just didn't have a lot, I had a lot to take in with my brother dying. That's interesting. We have a video ready to go about Rick oh, Simpson there you go. and cannabis oil. Yeah. So we'll be running that yeah, video in just excellent. a minute, but continue. Excellent. I just so thought I'd give you a I little I was kind of on that intro. path, you know, yeah. of, okay, there's this oil, and I know that there's a connection to cancer, but he passed away within nine months. Your brother. Yeah. My condolences. Yeah. How thank old was you. he when he um, passed away? He was he was forty nine. He's the okay. age I'm turning. So, yeah. um, so he passed away, and then once I had my daughter, um, I started having some issues. And if you know those of us who've given birth, kind of know that there's some after effects with the body. And I had a fissure, which is um, probably just as painful as childbirth. It was pretty bad. Hmm. So I tried everything. I tried naturopathic. I tried uh, Western medicine. I tried everything and it just was not getting better. So out of desperation, I got online and I typed in cannabis and I typed in fissure and I typed in a couple of things and up, up pops this article th about Tommy Chong uh, healing prostate cancer with suppositories. And I'm like, what? That's kind of cool. I wonder what that would do for my issue. Mm -hmm. So at two in the morning, I gathered a straw and I got, I had some oil and I found some, at the time I was using coconut oil, but I do not use that anymore. And I made a concoction and I put it in the straw and I froze it and I turned it into a suppository. And within two days it was completely gone. Mm -hmm. So my thinking was, okay, if this does this for me, so what can this do So what were the effects? People? You say it was completely gone. So you used how much um, oil well, in, I that, that in was, two days? Gosh, that was like, that was like six six years ago i see so i don't even remember it was like okay. i just i was throwing stuff into a pot kind of making it happen i was desperate <laughs> i was desperate it was painful um because you can't do anything you can't sit down stand up sleep you know you just can't do How anything long before you really saw the first effects of your concoction um i would say you know within 10 to 15 minutes the pain the 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 deep like nerve pain subsides like I realize oh my mind is not focused on that nerve pain so then when I get that relief I can start to use my brain okay what do I need to do to start getting my body to calm down you know I think this is a good time for us to run that video and we'll be back yeah. in just a few minutes after we yeah. run this video featuring Canadian Rick Simpson talking about uh, his advocacy for cannabis and the difference between full extract cannabis and the the cbd oils out there we'll be right back cool well they have no cure for multiple sclerosis they have no cure for cancer uh, the medical system don't have a goddamn cure for anything brother that's the problem with the medical system it's just a big scam you know, I mean, uh, I've, I've treated people with practically every disease known to man with these extracts. And overall, like I said, I, I, it's proven to me that there is no other medicine on this planet that even begins to compare with it. Well, I showed everybody how to do it right on the Internet. And I'm not in Slovenia. I'm in, in, I'm in Croatia, in Zagreb. But I'm planning on, uh, I have to go back to Amsterdam uh, in a week or two 
and then I'm planning to carry on to go to Africa because we're getting we're finally getting some projects underway there because the governments there they don't mind. See these governments up uh, like in the Netherlands and places like that, they're trying to keep people from producing the real extracts with the high THC content. You know, and they're they're trying to downplay the THC and oh they got everybody running around with this damn stupid CBD. You know, and C- CBD is just another cannabinoid, and it does have its own healing powers. But I'm telling you right now, if you've got cancer or something like that, you better get the THC into you because that's the most effective. You know, the, all, the, all the medical research, Dr. Guzman's research, Seth Group in the U.S., all of these different uh, research groups, they were researching THC, not CBD. So we, not, right now we got all these cancer patients running around for looking for CBD extracts. You know, it's, it's unbelievable what's going on here. And, and like I said, the governments are behind it because, you know, they're corrupted right to the damn core. But, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm hoping by the end of this summer that we'll finally start having some real Rick Simpson oil out there on the market. You know, the real stuff, not this garbage that people are selling with my, you know, they're using my name to sell all this damn trash. And I have nothing to do with any of these people. And then you see the the problem right now is like all of these seed companies, like they sell the same strains. But when you order these strains, like if you take a strain like Northern Lights, practically every seed company sells it. But if you order that damn strain from five different seed companies and you and you grow those uh, those plants, you'll find you're growing five different strains with different medical values. There's no stability in the seed industry. So this is the reason I want to do my own breeding project. And then I can start supplying seeds to people, you know, with, well, with uh, known medical values. You know, no more guesswork. Take the guesswork out. And, uh, you know, I, I think that this is what this industry needs right now. It needs some real research. It needs these strains to be stabilized, you know, so people can put confidence in what they're buying. And uh, basically, I'm out to spread these genetics, hopefully, all around the world. So I'm, yeah, you know, if I can get, once I get things established, uh, maybe in July or August or something like that, uh, or maybe in the early fall, I could go to Greece and uh, we could do all of this. Yeah, well, they have no right to control this. They never did. It'd be the same as if they were trying to control corn, for God's sakes. You know, this plant is harmless. It's non-addictive. No one in history has ever died from it. So what damn right do these stupid governments have to regulate it? What we need right now, we don't need legalization, and we don't need decriminalization. We need to have these stupid laws repealed, because they're all based in corruption and lies anyway. These laws are not real. They never have been. Now, I'll tell you one thing. They've done one hell of a con job. You know, I'm fighting for everyone's God-given right to go right out in your own backyard or your balcony, grow your own plants, and make your own medicine. I mean, we all have the natural right to do that, but these damn governments have prevented that. And by by doing so, you know, when you, I mean, when you look at the history of this plant, which was basically always known to be the most medicinal plant on earth, and then our governments outlaw its medicinal use, that should tell you something, what our governments are about. The governments and the big money, the people that control the pharmaceutical industry and the energy providers and the cotton industry and chemical industry, they're all in bed together, and they and then none of them want cannabis legalized. Oh, if you're talking about three people, then you're looking at a oh, likely uh, about a half a kilo will will produce at least a full cancer treatment. So if you're looking to, to get like 180 grams or something of extract, you're probably looking between one kilo and a kilo and a half of good bud material to produce it from. But it, it depends on the way you're going to grow it. You know, I mean, indoor growers, they generally grow the plants quite short, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, two feet tall or two and a half feet tall, very, very small plants. But you take that same plant and you put it outside, it can get huge. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I, I grew I, I grew plants back in Canada that had a kilo of bud on them. And, we, and I have a very poor climate where I come from, but I did have plants that would produce as much as a kilo of good prime bud. Well, if they're very, they're very, if they're, if these governments are doing this and they're they're preventing their people from healing themselves, guess what should happen to these governments?
They're not representing the people, George. It's that simple. They never. And same thing in Canada. You know, the. I mean, I started all this way back in 2003, making great big. Well, there's Rick Simpson. I had the honor of meeting him and spending some time with him down in Santiago, Chile, back in 2014, and he he autographed a copy of this book for me, and it's good to see him down there. But uh, have you ever got to meet him? I have not, okay. but he's been instrumental in you know my suppository research because mm -hmm. he really paved the way. He well, laid that's what it he out. said is needed is yeah. is research. Yeah. And so, tell yeah. us about your research. Well, I taught at Portland State for um, a couple of years in the Conflict Resolution Department, mm -hmm. and I worked with students to reconnect with their indigenous knowledge. So mm -hmm. really, the, the research base that I come from has to do with storytelling, listening to patients' stories, um, more intuition. It's not about placebo, and it's not about controlled studies. It's, it's about hearing what works and what doesn't work and adjusting it specific to the individual. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's really about decolonizing the way research is done and doing it from a non-Western point of view. So a lot of people come at me with uh, what I think about different things that are being said about cannabis, about the oils, about the bases, about suppositories. And I say I'm really not interested unless they're coming from a non-Western point of view. So I just really focus on research. Mm -hmm. um, I work specifically with each individual, what their needs are. Um, I asked you know what their stories are what their experience is and then we adjust dosages and levels specific to what their needs are um, this is not something you can get in a dispensary it's just something that an individual can contact me we can navigate what their needs are and then all i'm really doing is giving them the confidence to be able to make their medicine on their own and if they can't make it if they're physically unable i educate a family member or i educate a caregiver and i really pass it forward to them mm -hmm. because i'm really just making medicine for myself and my family and my community and i'm showing people my methods mm -hmm. and my applications and what works for me mm -hmm. how did you meet dana i know dana was uh you want to um, say actually, Dana? I just met Dana today. Oh, okay, but it was through Larry here. <laughs> yeah, Larry, yeah. Our, our mutual friend. Yeah. I see. You know, I see. And uh, we had quite a conversation this afternoon. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just thought, wow, <laughs> the information is just kind of right on point. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this it just passed. Tell us about the the things <laughs> you have here. You've got this this metal <laughs> device here. Yeah. So I kind of uh, leveled up from a straw. Um, there were some. You know, there, I was looking for a mold, and online mm -hmm. I could go to a cancer website and I could purchase a mold for $180. I'm on disability, I'm a single parent, I'm on a very low income, so just to get the mold to make it was a really big investment. So I did end up purchasing it because I knew, I just had an intuitive feeling that, that metal would be better than plastic. Mm -hmm. um, so I got the mold and I made the suppositories and then I came up with my first batch and started using it. But then I started getting really focused on the mold. Um, one of the advantages I have as a researcher is that I was, as an adult, diagnosed with high functioning autism or Asperger's. Mm -hmm. So I can fixate. <laughs> <laughs> so my brain fixates on decolonization and cannabis suppositories so <laughs> to molds. Yeah, I have moments of insomnia, <laughs> so I, you know, pop in a suppository. <laughs> um, but what I was finding is that some patients with arthritis or limited use of their hands, and including myself and my hands get flared up, is that I was having a hard time with this mold. And then I thought, gosh. Is this one of the $180 this molds? Is, this one was 180 I and see. And so I began doing research and finding out where could I get it at cost. And then I found a pharmacy website, um, Total Pharmacy, and I started connecting people to that website to get the molds at mm -hmm. at. $85 for a you know 10 cavity mold but I was still hung up on not being able to use this properly so I began um, innovating ideas about how I could make it for people who have limited use of their hands mm -hmm. and so that's really where my focus is now is to innovate the mold so that it's affordable it's accessible and that people with disability challenges can have better use of their hands when they have to make their suppositories. So if someone wants to reach you, I notice you have a website, it's backdoormedicine.org. That's yes. backdoormedicine.org. Tell us what our viewers will find there. Uh, well, I'm actually currently uh, redeveloping the website to include more 
uh, resources uh, of my business. I have mm -hmm. a mold and suppository consultations. I also am uh, publishing, republishing my doctoral dissertation, mm -hmm. and I'm also developing a documentary film based on my research. Mm -hmm. So the website is being uh, upgraded, but what's there is just a little bit of information about suppositories, uh, some of the resources I do have. I've had a YouTube video done three years ago, and that's posted there, so it kind of shows you the recipe that I was using back then to make the suppositories, but then things have changed through years of doing research. Mm -hmm. um, so everything's always being updated. I, don't, I tend to not publish a lot online because mm -hmm. research is always currently happening. Um, so I like to have think tanks and get together with people and talk about the research mm -hmm. so then others can be collaborative and, and contribute to it. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if someone wants to contact you to get involved, is that what's the best way? Uh, the website is a great way. Um, I also have an Instagram platform called Cannabis Suppositories. Um, and that really has, it's a public page and it's got a lot of photos. It shows a little bit about my research background and also the process of making the suppositories. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of kind of journaling about it, but also showing people what the process is. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I will, if you have a question for Dr. Dr. Paula Noel McPhee, then give us a call at that number there on your screen. We got about 10 minutes left. You can call us at 503-288-4442. That's 503-288-4442. And so uh, we have another little video. I just got back from the oldest marijuana event in the country, in the world actually, the Great Midwest Marijuana Harvest Fest in Madison, Wisconsin. And this was the 48th annual one. I went back to the uh, 18th annual one back in 1988. That was the <laughs> first time I went to it. And I've been to about a dozen of them since then. But here is my little four and a half minute talk at the Great Midwest Marijuana Harvest Fest. We'll be right back. This is from about two weeks ago. <laughs> you know, we are motivated by marijuana. Marijuana reaches something in us that has, goes back way beyond our ancestors and our grandparents. You know, cannabis has been cultivated at least 12,000 years. And it's possible that it's been grown more than 25,000 years or 30,000 years. Archaeologists have recently found cannabis with people 20,000 years ago in Central Asia. And by 12,000 years ago, its cultivation had spread to the Mediterranean basin. They found evidence of hemp farming in present-day Italy, before Rome, before the Etruscans. 12,000 years ago, its cultivation had spread from Central Asia to the, the shores of the Mediterranean. And you know, they say dogs were just domesticated about 7,000 years ago from the wolf, Canis lupus. And now they have bred, we've been breeding dogs and we have chihuahuas, we have poodles, we have Great Danes. They all came from the wolf. Well, we've been cultivating cannabis two, three, four times longer than we've been breeding dogs. And we, while we've changed dogs, we've also changed cannabis. And cannabis has changed us. In fact, the protein profile of hemp seed perfectly matches humans' nutritional needs better than any other plant protein. And then it makes more protein, more oil, more fiber, and more medicine than any other single plant. There's no plant that makes more seed oil than cannabis. There's no plant that makes more protein per land area than cannabis. There's no plant that makes more fiber than cannabis. And this is all wrapped up into one plant. So why is it that this is the plant that's been made illegal? The oldest crop, the most productive crop, and it's all about money and power and the continued centralization of economic and political control. It's because Rudolf Diesel invented the diesel engine to run on hip seed and other vegetable oils. Uh, Ford, Henry Ford, created a car where the body was made out of hip seed oil and other plant matter and running on hip seed and other plant oils. It's the people who brought us 
marijuana prohibition are the petrochemical, pharmaceutical, military, industrial, transnational, corporate elite, fascist, sons of a bitches, and we've got to take this plant back from them. And, and when we do, with the fiber, we will stop deforestation and create thousands of jobs. With the protein, we'll stop world hunger. With the oil, we'll stop pumping carbon in the form of coal and oil out of the ground and into the atmosphere. Hemp will find a balance there. So we've got to do this for the planet and for ourselves, because this plant is something that speaks to us. You know, every major religion on this planet once used cannabis or still uses cannabis. In the Buddha is supposed to have got found enlightenment by eating one hip seed. The holy anointing oil of Christ and Judaism is primarily cannabis oil. And so this is a sacred plant. It's something that it, it treats so many different medical conditions, it's hard to believe. When a friend of mine named Jack Herrer, who spoke here many times years ago, told, but he told me that marijuana makes you live longer, I kind of thought that was crazy, but now I know it's true. You actually live longer if you use cannabis. Yeah. So I, I'm going to wrap it up here. I want to thank you guys for coming out. I'll be back next year. I hope to see you here and help restore him. Right. So there it is. That the longtime watchers of this show have heard many variations of that, but that's <laughs> it in a nutshell. So back to your your suppositories. So you, you don't use coconut oil anymore. Do you use hemp seed oil? No. Well, right now I'm. Never tried hemp seed. I oil? haven't actually, and I'm. I just started Here's a looking at bit new of hemp bases. Seed oil yeah. Right here. We've got our that's hemp flame idea. of freedom. Nice. And this is hemp. That's our wick next week. This oh, is, nice. Uh, the it's just pure hemp right there. Yeah. And that's why cannabis is made illegal. <laughs> they don't want us to burn it. We, they want us to burn petrochemicals. Right. But uh, again. How do you make the, the uh, suppository? Well, I, when I started, I started using coconut oil, but there was a couple people that came to me with IBS, and they found that the suppository would almost immediately cause them diarrhea. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, let me check into that. So I did some research, and I found out that coconut oil, you know, you hear about oil pulling. When you s put it in your mouth and you swish it around, you, it pulls the, the toxins out. Mm -hmm. Well, can or coconut oil can cause what's called a healing response which is great, it sounds good, but if you're compromised and you have cancer or your immune system's down or your guts aren't functioning and you put something in there that initiates a healing response, AKA detox, mm -hmm. it's gonna start pulling toxins and not everybody can handle that. So I thought, well, let's switch it over to cacao because that's something you can, the body recognizes it as food. It has a lot of benefits. It has a lot of benefits. So I started using that and- So you're using chocolate oil, basically. Yeah, I mean, it smells good when you, you know, melt it down. Mm -hmm. So essentially what I'll do is to get 15 suppositories, I'll melt down about a fourth of a cup of cacao on the lowest possible setting. I don't want it to boil or get too hot. Um, I'll melt that down within like a minute or two, and then I'll pull it off the, the heat, I'll let it cool down for a second, and then I'll add a gram of oil. Then I'll mix a that gram of RSO a gram of RSO, Phoenix RSO, Tears, yeah. or high THC, high THC the, the ones that I made for tonight, they were 740 milligrams for the, for the gram. Mm -hmm. So they're roughly 50 milligrams per suppository. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll add the, the gram of oil, I'll put it in a little mason jar to cool down. Um, and gotta let you know, we've only got about two and a half minutes left. Right on. Before. Um, I'll take a syringe, I'll pop it into the mold, and I'll put it in the freezer for 15, 20 minutes, up, you know, up to an hour if I need to. Um, and then I'll open the, the mold, which can be somewhat difficult, and I have my suppository. Mm -hmm. So the beauty of it is that there is no head high on, with these. There's a relief of symptoms. And RSO can give you a very intense oh, yeah. head with high if you ingest amount. it. Yeah. I, I took the smallest amount, yeah. a little smear that was on a table. The yeah. only, I was at Willie Nelson's house <laughs> and there was it, in Maui. Oh, and there's wow. just a Maui. little bit left there. And I the only time I ever took it, I just went like that. I put it in oh. my mouth and I was so yeah. high. Yeah, it's it wasn't intense. even a drop. It was a no, smear was a on the table. Yeah. Well, you can get 80. That's the only time I've ever used it, by the way. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, that happened to me once, and I said, no, 
no more. You can, mm -hmm. but really with the suppository, you get about 85% of the plant medicine, mm -hmm. where taking it orally, you get about 35, 30 to 35%. Mm -hmm. So with the suppository, you get the most amount of um, medicine out and of that. And you don't get that and intense high. you don't high. have the head high. Well, that's something that would definitely interest a lot yeah. of different patients because a lot of patients are put off by the intense high caused by right. taking it orally. Right. But, uh, yeah. you know, that's, if someone wants to reach Paula Noel, you can look at backdoormedicine.org. That's backdoormedicine.org. Is there anything you want to say in closing, Dana? <laughs> oh, Willie, he probably told you that that was maple syrup. That you had I've got an interesting <laughs> story about that. That isn't how it goes, but I won't go into it right now. I want to thank you for thank coming you, on sir. here. Thank you, too, for coming back here. Thank you. Viewers, we got John Cornett ready to play some music on the way out. If you are looking for a doctor to help you get a medical marijuana permit, we have a referral service. We can refer you all over the nation. Just call us cool. at 503-235-4606. It's 503-235-4606. Thanks for watching. Tune in next week and help us restore him. For 12, Thank you, John. thousand years, she's healed. Our lives for a thousand more. She will break the fight. She's my Joan of Arc, reaches through the flames, says, Come to me, I can heal your pain. She's my Mary Jane, she's my Mary Jane, she's my...